Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second lecture here on YouTube in the series that is uh, specifically for period 6, 1865 to 1898. <clears throat> this one is going to be focusing on labor since the first one focused on capital. We're going to see the interaction that these two have with each other and the battles that they're going to have to go through. Now, this is just an overview of the key concepts for this. Uh, some of the things we're going to do, obviously, very more specific in class. But at least you'll have some background knowledge for this before we actually do some of the lessons that we're going to uh, take place later on. Uh, you might remember in the first video, I had the same focus question. And I'm going to keep it here because, again, we're thinking of causes and effects. Uh, as one of our skills that we use in AP U.S. History. Uh, these causes are factors that help to create the United States into its industrial society. But here we're going to focus a lot more on the effects, the idea of the rise of labor, also what happens in the South at this time. That'll be the last of the concepts that we'll look at. So let's go ahead and get into our concepts. We're still in 6.1. Da 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 da! For me, it's very early in the morning, so when I pause to take a drink, it's going to be coffee. So I'm going to do that right now because it's very early for me. So mm. I don't know if you're coffee drinkers, but uh, and I don't know what time of the day you're watching this. So maybe you get something to drink. Just start off. There you go. Oh, someone's got some potato chips over there. Just don't get your keyboards greasy. Ugh. Anyways, as we see here in 6.1, Again, we're talking about the technological advances, blah, 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 large-scale production, all that kind of stuff, and capitalism. But we're now 6.1 Roman numeral 2, and we're going to see this development, how it affects labor. And we're going to start off with a financial panic, actually. If we go to letter A, uh, at this time period, the federal government is practicing laissez-faire. Hopefully you remember this expression from your world history class. Because I know that was such a great experience for everybody. All right, we'll move on from that. And uh, laissez-faire is a French expression. Not exactly 100% word-for-word translation. Some people say it's hands-off or to keep out of. In other words, the government doesn't try to get involved in the economy at all. They allow, well, the capitalists to be capitalist. So it promoted economic growth, as we see. Uh, but it also, when there were these economic downturns, as we now call them, uh, the government really didn't get involved. And the first big one is the Panic of 1873. This is going to be a panic we're going to talk a lot about because it's also going to come back when we do the agriculture uh, video. Um, but here for labor, let me explain something to you. This was a very long panic. Sometimes they call it the Long Depression. Uh, this time period, it lasted nearly 65 months. Now, uh, in some respects, there were some things that happened uh, where the government did get a little involved. We're going to talk about uh, what happens with the Coinage Act is going to take place. I don't have that here in this video, but we're going to talk about the government taking silver out of circulation, uh, deflation policy of the Republican Party versus inflation policy that debtors and especially farmers want, where they want to increase the money supply, thereby, thereby devaluing the dollar. And that becomes a big fight here after this panic of 1873. But what I want to focus on is during this 65 months, the railroads were the ones that started to have the problems in the beginning. If you ever played a Monopoly board game, perhaps you're familiar with B&O Rail Railroad. And no, B&O did not stand for body order, as a lot of us as kids often thought. It stood for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. They were one of the first ones to start having problems. Now, in order to save themselves, uh, they would often do things like cut workers' salaries. Well, in 1876 or in 1877, they will cut salaries three times. And basically, this is what's going to set off anger with the people that work for the Baltimore and the Ohio. And they're going to go on this massive strike. Now it's called the Great Strike because to show solidarity, you're going to get workers 
This started in what is West Virginia. You're going to get railroad workers in New York, Pennsylvania, and Maryland will eventually join with them in solidarity and also go on strike. Then eventually also Illinois and Missouri will go on strike as well. Hence the expression, the Great Railroad Strike. Uh, this lasted a total of about 45 days. You know, you're, uh, you are tying up the railroads. Things like, it's funny when you think about it. The word education, great word, does not appear anywhere in the Constitution. Hmm. But the word mail, right, like the U.S. mail, to, to mail a letter, right? I, I know this is, this is something that I probably have to explain to you. There was a time before time, children, when human beings would sit down at a desk and take penneth in hand with pieces of paper and they would scribble words to their loved ones, uh, to people they knew in other parts of the country. They would fold up the letter when they were done, stick it in an envelope and put a stamp on it, put a return address and the addresses to where they're sending it to and put it in a mailbox. And the U.S. postal system had a job because of this. Today, you do everything electronically, text messaging, right? you probably have never written a letter. I don't know, maybe something you have, you're going to come to school tomorrow and say, Mr. Lennon, I wrote a letter. I don't know if I care. But most of us don't do that anymore. But in that time period, it's very important. And that's actually protected in the Constitution, the delivering of mail. So you had state militias that rose up to try to put this down. You had some private um, police forces that were hired. And Rutherford B. Hayes, President of the United States, will also send in federal troops. Uh, needless to say, this became very violent, uh, this particular thing. And in the end, historians believe somewhere around 100 people in total are going to die as a result of this great railroad strike. But this starts to basically bring a lot of men who are in various industries when it comes to this growing industrial America who begin to see the need to protect themselves. And unions are going to start to come, right, in order to bring that protection. Another issue that they're having, this workforce is becoming very diverse. There are tens of thousands of immigrants coming to America every month, probably, obviously in the course of a year, tens and tens of thousands are showing up and they're entering our workforce, uh, a growing internal population as well. People are migrating from one part of the country to the other part. People are actually leaving the farm and going to the big cities because the big cities offer jobs. You're going to get a lot of African Americans in the South during this time period as well are going to try to go north to try to get some of the jobs as well. There's also this increase in child labor that's going to happen. Uh, this is going to be one of the things that a lot of labor unions eventually will take up the fight uh, to try to end child labor in America. Because as I mentioned to you in class, the word teenager really does not fully exist at this time period. It doesn't become popularized until the mid 20th century. Uh, if you're a young man uh, or a young adolescent, as young as 12, and you can work a coal mine as these young boys are doing, you're working coal mines. Um, so this is what's happening as well. This massive growing workforce uh, Americans are moving from the farm to the big city. African Americans are trying to escape things like sharecropping and they're moving. You've got a growing immigration is happening and a growth in child labor as well. All this is also starting to happen. Another reason why labor unions are going to come. Here in letter C, it tells you this battle now begins. And again, whenever I tell you the one, two, three, four, I'm showing you again your multiple choice question. What are they fighting over? Well, obviously, first and foremost, wages, right? Uh, as this country's getting rich, those who are the backbone of this are wondering, well, why are they not getting anything out of this? <laughs> Working conditions. We'll talk about some of this very specifically in class, especially things like the meatpacking industry. It is very common for someone to lose a hand, a foot, an arm, and in the meat grinders, and sometimes they didn't stop production. Ugh that really gives a reason why uh, your hamburger might be extra salty. I don't know, ugh. Mm. I had to get another sip of coffee for that one. Uh, workers are organizing locally and national unions 
And of course, this led to direct confrontation with the business leaders. This political cartoon, as I told you, I love the cartoons of this time period, is known as a set to between monopoly and labor. It's a joust. And you see the, the monopolists are on this gold-plated or gilded. Uh, it's actually a train, as you can see. And he's got a gold-plated set of armor, right? He's got the big lance. Hello, it's a lance. And of course, poor labor, right? He doesn't even have a button for a shirt. He has no shoes. His horse has poverty on it and his tongue sticking out. Uh, yeah. Labor will win some concessions for Americans. Uh, the 40 hour work week. Eventually, uh, paid vacations will eventually come. Uh, there, are, there are things that they do win. Eventually, we don't have child labor anymore, for instance. So there are things that they win. But we're going to get into some of these big strikes in class. And you're going to see, especially with the Homestead Steel strike in the 1890s, that when capital finally wins, wins. They, they win. And we basically live in a world where corporations run a lot. But Hey, we like our Starbucks. We like our Apple phones and our Androids and, you know, anything else you can think of that you like. You know, they give us stuff. They keep us kind of docile. We're going to focus a lot on, later on, the Knights of Labor. They become one of the biggest labor unions of the time. Terrence Powderly. An injury to one is an injury to all. We're going to talk a lot about Terrence Powderly. Just so you know, I have a nice little cheat sheet that I'm going to give you that's going to have all the labor unions and, and their various movements on one side of the sheet. On the back side of the sheet, we'll have all the major strikes and the protests that take place and a big riot. We're going to talk about the Haymarket riot uh, in Chicago that eventually ruins the Knights of Labor, um, something that they get blamed for that they actually did not do. right? But these are the big unions. Of course, the American Federation of Labor is just that. It's a federation. Uh, so it's actually made up of multiple labor unions that becomes protected under one umbrella, the American Federation of Labor. Uh, you notice 1886 to the present. They eventually merge with the CIO uh, in the 1950s, and they're still around. They're still one of the biggest labor organizations in America. And again, we'll talk more specifically about these guys in class. But this just gives you an idea of what the war they're fighting about. There's a multiple choice question and in a couple, some of these very important labor unions that we'll talk about later on. And then we'll end it here with D, uh, the New South, right? So even the South starts to industrialize, sort of, right? Textiles come South, especially in Georgia and the Carolinas. And if you notice, again, here are children working these machines because their little feet and little hands could easily get in here and change these. I think these are bobbins. I think they're known as bobbins. Uh, I'm sure someone might correct me on that. But And again, this often led to some industrial accidents for children. So again, we've got to have those child labor laws have to come. But mostly, the New South, although they tried to change their image here in the 1880s through the early 1900s as becoming a New South based on you know industry and growth, it's mostly still a white planter, white merchant, prosperous society. We've already talked about sharecropping. Later on, we're going to get into uh, Booker T. Washington and uh, what he's going to talk about, which is going to become very controversial, but we'll do that in class, and the rise of W.E.B. Du Bois. And uh, so there, there is, this brings about uh, a fight also between African Americans and whites because of segregation is going to come as well, is what I'm getting at. But mining comes to the South, especially in the Appalachian Mountains, furniture, and cigarettes. Uh, one of the big industrials of the time is a guy named James Buchanan Duke. And if any of you know that name, Duke, again, like we mentioned in the last video, Cornelius Vanderbilt gets a school named after him in Tennessee. Well, Duke gets a school named after him in North Carolina. I think you might have heard of this school. Maybe. I don't know. All right. So that brings it into this particular lesson. Again, I will have a video log later on on, on the Edmodo that will go with this. So, And we'll talk about when this stuff is due when we get back to class. All right. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Whenever it is you are watching this. And talk to you later. Bye-bye.